episode 126 of the Rudest Wrestling Podcast. We are into March, Matt Dernlin, and it is like I like to sing around. It's the most wonderful time <laughs> of the year. Yeah, I'm not exactly a, a caroler by any means, and I usually sing in March. It's it's this week coming up. We've got the NAIA championships. We've got the NCAA women's championships at the WC WC was the women's wrest women's collegiate wrestling coalition, not to be confused with the WCWA, with just the NCAA schools up in Adrian. We've got conference qualifier weekend with everybody at the D1s on the same level now that the Pac-12 has moved to this weekend. And like I said, this is the most wonderful time of the year for a wrestling fan. It's the postseason, Matt. There was a time, see, back in the wrestling 411 era, Kyle Klingman and I, who's now with Track Wrestling, Kyle and I were, were, we did this road trip. We went from the junior college nationals that were actually in Rochester, Minnesota, so it wasn't that big of a road trip. Then we drove to D3s in Cedar Rapids. Then we drove to Houston for D2s and drove to St. Louis for D1s. We were on the road together for a month. And we also crammed in a, a super regional in Division Two in there in Marshall, Minnesota, one of those weekends, too. So uh, that was the first year that I had gone D1, D2, D3. And now the calendar is shifting a little bit. And I started announcing the NAIA championships a couple years ago. I've been to the last. Uh, actually, this will be my ninth. I can tell you why. Because every time I've gone to the NAIA national championships, Grandview has won it. And I, I won it in their first one back in 2000. I was there when they won their first one back in Des Moines in 2012. So uh, we've also got the Junior College Nationals and Council Bluffs this weekend. The NAI is coming up in Wichita, which is a new host. And, and I want to say about the NAI, we'll go in depth a little bit later on that. But as a host, a state like Kansas with a really, really good wrestling, the Kansas Wrestling Coaches Association really does bend over backwards for any wrestling event that comes in. And it's not just, you know, they've got a well-organized state chapter with USA Wrestling. But when you get to the folk style side of things, the high school and the collegiate side, Kansas, man, they they really do such a great job. They're adding junior college programs. They're adding women's programs. They're adding NAIA programs. They've had some, t some teams reclassify. You know, Newman, for example, started as an NAIA team. They've reclassified to Division II. So I'm looking forward to going to Wichita and having my annual steak dinner with Jerry Briscoe at the NAIA Championships. It's become a tradition. Sometimes it's not steak. Last year it was Jethro's Barbecue in Des Moines, which is, which is phenomenal. But we've got that. We've got the college qualifiers. Big Ten's going to be jam-packed at Rutgers. The Big 12 has found a great home at the, the BOK, the Bank of Oklahoma Center in Tulsa. Lehigh does an amazing job. And Matt, you know this from, from your time out east. In, in, in Lehigh, it's like every other year, it seems like they're hosting EIWAs because they do such a great job with it. I announced the Pac-12s one year when they were at Stanford. They're back at Stanford this year. You know, great facility. They actually get pretty good administrative support there. So uh, when I was out there at Stanford a couple of years ago, I, I was just really amazed with how much the their their conference, even though their conference doesn't have a whole lot of wrestling teams as all sport members, their administration and their leaders within the Pac-12 really seem to appreciate wrestling. And then the SoCon down in Boone, which is going to be, from a tournament standpoint, that's going to be good. So it is it is quite literally one of the busiest weekends because while I'm at the NAIs, I've got screens up from the Junior College Nationals. I've got screens up from all the other ones that are on Friday and are on Saturday. Uh, it, you know, it's the, the Max and DeKalb in Northern Illinois. I forgot to mention that, but it is like literally wrestling overload on your senses. And, you know, I go from the NAIAs and then I'll, I'll, I'll head back and then I'll turn around and I'll drive down the Cedar Rapids for the division threes, which is going to be phenomenal. We got another good team race this year. And then for the first time in my life, I get to basically drive less than, you know, it's a 15 minute drive from my house to us bank stadium where we're going to host uh, the NCAA championships. And we'll, we'll touch on, the 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 outrage of social media that went on last week after that picture got tweeted, but Matt, it's busy for me because I've got to save my voice for three straight events. What's the schedule like for the crew at Rudis? Well, it's similar. I mean, we we we've already jumped in the into the heart of our our uh, postseason competitions with our with our event crew. We've we've serviced a number of state tournaments. We did the the first women's Ohio women's state tournament, girls state tournament a couple weeks ago. Uh, We've been in in Georgia, Alabama, down in Florida. We're, I know we're you said NBA Alabama. Was that was that accidental inflection of the Southern twang, or did you? Was that kind uh, of a Freudian thing here? No, that that was a Freudian thing. That was you, you didn't mean to say to Alabama, like, but you did. I, I I didn't, but I did. But yeah, so we've been in Alabama. We're going to be uh, here in Ohio uh, at the Ohio State tournament coming up. We'll obviously be at the the Fan Fest at the NCAA tournament. So yeah, I mean we're we're running you know full gear and then you know, get ready for the Olympic trials and, you know, everything with our athletes and with, with, you know, 
fan fest there as well. So yeah, we've got a, a, a busy season, but this, this is the fun stuff. I mean, this is a, like you said, I mean, this is the exciting time of the year. There's nothing greater than, you know, seeing the opportunity to see all these athletes from around the country in every division accomplish some pretty special things, both individually and for their team. So, um, all the, all the talk, all the conjecture is about to be settled here in the next couple of weeks. So it's going to be really, really exciting. Yeah, a couple of the news items. Of course, the allocations came out on February 27th. We'll discuss that in a moment. But I want to start with kind of the reaction for the NCAA championships. And before we get to that reaction, because for every reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I think, is that, was that, was that what it is? I don't know. I learned that from an Incubus song back in the day. My one of the things that I put together, Matt, during this course of the three weeks, the busiest time of the year, I, I just I kill myself with this. It's called my wrestling preview guide or the guide. And I've got a special promo code for rudest viewers of, of this this particular episode, this podcast. If you're listening to it, if you're watching it on YouTube, go to wrestling preview guide dot com slash rudest. And that will get you a digital file. That's that's a fifteen dollars, five dollars off. So normally it's nineteen ninety nine. You'll get it for fourteen ninety nine. You'll save five bucks just by watching the show clicking that link, wrestlingpreviewguide.com slash Rudis. And that is a 200 plus page digital preview guide, which I've crafted basically to be, be really good for, let me pull, pull, you know, for your, for your tablet, your iPad, you can look at it on your phone. And if you've got your computer, if you're at home and you're not at the tournament, it's a great supplement. It's got everything right there. Every single result from every single athlete in the tournament. There is, there is history here that you can't find anywhere else. For those older fans that that remember the old NCAA, the guides, the little handbooks, they were about this big. They came out and they stopped that in around 1982. This is kind of an updated version of that. So you'll be able to know where all the national champions uh, and things like that, the past history, but it also breaks it down by state. Nobody else has the breakdown of, you know, it's always an, an issue, man. I was like, who's got the most All-Americans by state? If you buy this, you will know it. You will win more bar bets. Because you have this, <laughs> you will actually be instigating people to bet because you know on your phone you can pull it up. No, 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 no. There we go. See, Tulsa Central has the most national champions from any high school. You know, it's always those type of things. And there's a lot of trivia in here. And it's something that I've, I've put together. There's team capsules. Every You'll know the record of every team, the coaches, the coaching staffs, the qualifiers, the records, what they did in their conferences, all quickly accessible. And it's also interactive. So it's a table of contents. Oh, I need to go to 125. Scroll down. Boom. Oh quick hits of who's in what weight class and, and things of that nature. So basically every statistical breakout that you can think of, some fantasy wrestling primers in there. I'm working some with WrestleStat on some of the stuff that they put out that's, that's going to be really good. So wrestlingpreviewguide.com slash Rudis. So when you go into U.S. Bank Stadium and you've got your tablet or your phone, you can quickly pull it up. And if you're sitting at home or you're watching from a bar or you're watching from a speakeasy that you may have like I do, you can have all that information at your fingertips. Wrestlingpreviewguide.com, save five bucks using the promo code Rudis. So again, I made it easy. Wrestlingpreviewguide.com slash Rudis. Save your five bucks. Matt, that's a pitch. It's an <laughs> Yeah, but this is a must for any hardcore fan, for any fan in general that really wants to know anything involving the NCAA championship. This guide is an embarrassment of riches. I've seen it. I've looked at it. Jason. I mean, the amount of effort that you've put in to, to, to give this to the fans is absolutely incredible. You know, I recommend it. I've seen it, you know, for huge wrestling geeks like us who just love, love knowledge, love the history of the sport. You know, there's not a better guide for wrestling than, you know, this. So I would recommend it to everybody. I mean, it's ab absolutely you know, just a treat to read through. Yeah, let me just close the sales pitch out by one thing. ESPN uses this. I They actually, you know, it is a digital publication, but they, for the last several years ago, okay, we need 20 of these printed up. And they're not cheap to print at Kinko's, so they take care of it. These are on the, the, the mat side scores tables, like for the broadcasters, for like what you're hearing in your earphones in the, in the venue, and also what you're seeing on like ESPN3 or ESPNU or ESPN Plus, whichever platform the, the championships are on this year. They've they've got access to these stats, so ESPN's production crew has been using it. the The NCAA has been quick to look at it, and they make sure they also have one. Granted, they have the stats and and all the track wrestling access, but it's also nice to have. They've I actually print a book for them now. I don't print them for everybody, so this is not a a, a physical publication because again, just the shipping alone to get it done March seventeenth because the qualifiers come out that Wednesday. I've got five days and a tournament to announce in between to put all this stuff together. So it is a digital product. If there is an update that needs to be made before the first whistle blows, 
you get an update, boom, you get an automatic email said, Hey, there's a new file. You can get it. So that's how you do it. And, uh, you know, it's been something that it's a labor of love and it's, it is something that I do. Yeah. I've it's, it's part of the, the income that I bring in as an independent content creator and as a small business owner, but it's something that even I, I designed it because it's what I would want as a wrestling fan. So think of that. That's exactly how I've designed it. What do I want to see if I'm sitting there? What do I want to know quickly? That's how it's designed. And that's, that's the, the impetus behind why I created it. Yeah. Type in the code, get a discount, get informed. All right. Now, the speaking of U.S. Bank Stadium, the NCAA wrestling Twitter account put out a photo. Well, and I want to use the word photo loosely. It was a rendering and it was, uh, was you know, it didn't have everything you're going to see on the floor, but it was a general outline of how the mats were going to be placed, which was seemingly to be the biggest question about the use of a, a football stadium as a venue for the NCAA championships. Now, in the past last year, there was such a rage about lack of tickets. Now we have more tickets than have ever been available before. We have the option to put more than 40,000 wrestling fans to our showcase event. Yes, the Olympics is the pinnacle of the sport of wrestling, but the showcase event, as far as the English-speaking audience around the world, especially North America and the United States, is the NCAA Wrestling Championships. Very few wrestling events outside of maybe like those festivals in Senegal and Mongolia get more viewers, more live attendance than the NCAA Wrestling Championships. So it struck me as a bit odd. And, you know, there was some some division amongst how those of us in the media were responding to some of the complaints here. And I was guilty of that. And I walked back some of my uh, my initial, I guess, terseness at the the complaints that I was expecting to hear, and which I did hear. I wasn't exactly wrong on the fact that people were going to complain because you know, we are a sport that likes to complain uh, more than more than some others, and based on my experience. But we we got this outrage of like I'm not going to be able to see you know, and then some points were being brought up, Matt. But yeah, this it actually makes sense because how many other wrestling events do people have far away seats? I mean, if you go to a dual meet, unless it's like Carver Hawkeye, you're really not going to be that far away from the mat. So this event normally is the furthest away our wrestling fans are sitting away from the action. And now we've added that to it by putting it in a, a football stadium, which has got further away from the action. So people are going to be inconvenienced with their viewpoint. But I, I still can't wrap my head around the fact that I believe it is more important to get more eyes on the sport, to 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 see the the atmosphere, the to be part of the party. It's what it is, man. It's a big party. It's our biggest party of the year. To be part of that, to me, is more important than being inconvenienced, you know, for, for, for three days in March. Yeah. You're spending a lot of money. Yeah. Do you need binoculars? I don't know. I've never been in the facility yet, but I just felt like some of the outrage was a little bit premature because nobody's been in the facility yet to actually see it. And you know, it's a first time for everything. Wrestling usually is afraid to take chances. Well, drive fast, take chances, put 40,000 butts in the seat. So that's where I was coming at this from. And, uh, I, I mean, like I said, I, I, I understand the concerns, but I just feel like putting that many more butts in the seat and getting people to, you know, having a crowd eventually replace those people that are getting older who are eventually going to, they're going to, they're not going to go anymore. And we we've got to replace them with a generation of people who know what it's like to want to go to the nationals. So that's, that's kind of where my soapbox was about all this. Well, I mean, for me, JB, I mean, if you look at the last 10, 15 years at the attendance at the NSA tournament, we can't find venues that are big enough, big enough to, to fit, the demand for for the championships we've we've fit it in basically you know concert venues hockey venues you know and we're, we've gotten to the point and we're selling those out you know for the last 10 years everybody's been compl- there's no tickets there's i can't there, my school's not getting enough tickets in their section they're you know every year for the past five years before i got out of coaching Every every year I had to send out a, a mass email to my fan base and said, hey, right away, our allocation, our request has been cut in half. So and that happened to every every fan base across across the country. And when there's there's. The the demand was not the supply wasn't to meet meeting the demand. So you have to go to, to a, a bigger venue and us as a community in this sport, we're like, Hey, we need more. We want more eyes. We need more visibility. We want to grow the sport. Well, we've done that. And now we're complaining about it. I just, I don't get it. It's for me, the conversation starts and stops there. We want more eyes on the sport. We've got more eyes on the sport. You know, we need bigger facilities. We want, we wanted more. And now we're complaining about 
getting what we're demanding. I, I just don't, I don't get it. I get the fact that people are, are going to be upset that they're not going to have as good of a viewpoint as they've had in the nationals. But there's a couple things I want to point out about the human eye. You've got eight mats. You cannot watch all eight mats at one time. You might be able to kind of look at two and a half, three scoreboards kind of simultaneously, but that's not going to change. You're just going to be doing this a little bit more versus, you know, a, a little bit of a turning, you know, and then look at the amount of lower bowl seating. Well, at these arenas, the lower bowl is actually one of the smallest portions of it. It's like less than half. Now there's going to be twice as many lower bowl seats than you've got. So you're, you're closer to the action than most people are anyway, even though you're further away back from it. So and that's in theory. Again, I cannot speak on this with any authoritative viewpoint because I've not been in U.S. Bank Stadium yet. Although I did just see a clip of they're playing baseball in there right now. Minnesota and then some hmm. junior colleges are playing baseball inside U.S. Bank Stadium. But again, it, it seems to me that where I, where I really, my biggest speaking point on this is about growth. And I don't mean necessarily the growth of the championships. And, and you know, people use the term good for the sport, growth for the sport, like it's a throwaway cliche to validate any type of thing you're doing. You know, oh, well, media, well, we just want to grow the sport. Well, let's look at what this does. There have been, every year we do that announcement, and it started with Sandy and, and about how many people have been there at you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I know Gray Simons was standing right behind me. He's been there 50, probably almost 60 years. The guy just turned 80 and he, and he won the thing three times. So there's people that have been there in those seats. They've gotten close. They've figured out, they, they, they feel like they've earned the right to sit there and get that great view, whether it be through donations through their school or the NWCA or, or they're a referee or their family referee. I mean, I had access to tickets as a staff member. This year, I actually bought tickets for my family who have never actually had the opportunity really to see me in action. And, you know, I want to expose the sport of wrestling to my, to, to my in-laws. They know a little bit about it in my family. So I bought tickets. This is also where I think I'm also qualified to say I'm concerned about the viewing experience because some of the feedback has been, oh, well, I get a credential. What the hell do I know about the, the, the fan experience? Plenty. Cause I'm going to spend more tickets on this thing than I will actually make boo hoo me. But we're looking at the age of the ticket buyer at the NCAA championship. It's going up. And I was the, you know, I was basically the editor of amateur wrestling news for 18 months for a couple of years, a couple of years ago, each week we were getting emails about people saying, Hey, please cancel my subscription. My husband has passed away. Well, it, it, it's not exactly the greatest thing to talk about, but our fans are going, the ones that are buying the tickets consistently are getting older. Well, how do we replace them? They started going to the national championships when they were on college campuses, the events didn't sell out and they had access for inexpensive tickets and they got hooked on it. a lot of them were, you know, in that Gable era when Iowa was, was hammering thing and, and, and people at the university of Iowa really gravitated to the nationals and, and people in Oklahoma gravitated to the nationals because it was easy to get tickets. It wasn't super expensive. And then as the tournament grew around them, they were still there. Well, behind them, and we started going to these arenas in 2003 in Albany. Well, the college student, is now priced out of going to, it's a month rent basically to go to the NCAA championships for a college student, or if you're right out of college and you know, we, we know about talk about student loan debt and things like that. It is a really big expense to go. And now we're seeing a generation of, of wrestling fans that have been priced out. They have been unable to go for the last 15 years as adults. And now when they get into their forties, they now have the income and they're finding that tickets are hard to get. Well, What's going to happen when our older fans are no longer allowed, though that hardcore, you know, 55 plus fan base that have been going since they were in their 20s? We didn't have that. Like people my age, I'm 40 now. I don't have a lot of those peers that came with us at nationals. There were always older people or they were athletes, and we don't necessarily see everybody stick around. So to to finish up the point here, we've got to replace the fan base that are going to buy tickets. And we lost a generation of them when we went to these arenas, and the prices are what they are. So from my vantage point, adding 25,000 people, more than we normally get potentially, to see a championship live, it can re-energize the opportunity to like, all right, well, well, now we're all of age. Let's make sure that we can save for this trip now. Now that they've experienced it, or the eight-year-old that's watching, you know, the, the guys from Iowa, the kid from like, you know, Osage, Iowa that wants to watch you know, has heard about Doug Schwab and, and, and that growing up is like, oh, I could, I could want to watch Northern Iowa Panthers now. And then they're going to want to go every single year. And they, they create that, that, that moment that makes them a wrestling fan. And that's what I want. That's what I think is the biggest selling point for me about this. Yes, 
you're going to be inconvenienced. It's not going to be the exact same sight line as you're used to. But you know what? I feel like your inconvenience for one year has a greater good. It, that greater good is the eight-year-old who's going to be able to go to the single session ticket for 20 bucks that his parents couldn't afford. They can't take a family of four on a whim for a tournament like this. They're going to have that access. It may be up high, but you're in the building. You're going to see it. So that, to me, is the win for this. And like I said, this is a soapbox moment. I'm, go, I'm going off on a ta- you know, It's not a tangent, but this is something I feel passionate about. Is we're going to have people that are going to have to fill those seats, and we're, we're, we, we lost a generation of them. Now, now they don't know what it's like to go, and it's it's a tough ticket. Every four years, there are bids out there for bigger dome stadiums. Everybody that's in a CVB and a sports commission that is interested in this tournament is going to look at what's happening at U.S. Bank Stadium. It can be a fail or it can be a win, and that's where I stand. Well, I think that was beautifully said. And to your point, you, you have to have the opportunity to set the hook. Right. Once these fans are hooked, they're coming back for life. I mean, speak to anybody in the re- in the arena that's been there to, to multiple championships. All you have to do is experience it one time and you will come back. But if you don't have the opportunity, how are you going to be able to come back? You get you have to expand the opportunity to grow our fan base. And I think that's, you know, this is going to accomplish that. It's going to grow our fan base. It's going to give more people the opportunity to experience it for the first time. And once they experience it, I guarantee you they're going to come back. But what I would like to speak to, the people that are going to have an, an improved experience, and obviously we, we, we want to have a great fan-friendly experience that people want to engage, want to enjoy, want to come back to. But the people that are really going to be affected are the people that are, are going to perform that weekend. And that's going to be the athletes because any athlete or any coach, and we don't discuss this much because it's all we've ever known, but as a coach and as an athlete, you know, navigating the bowels of, of the arenas, getting out, you know, being in the tunnel, you know, like a sardine can waiting to get called on deck, wait to be, you know, you can't even go on deck because you have to stand in the tunnel because there's no standing room in and around the match. You can't walk easily to to your mat placement or anything. So just the amount of space that's going to allow these athletes to breathe, allow them to re- relax just a, li- a little bit better. That's one of the things that most fans don't really consider. You know where these athletes hang out? They're glorified storage closets underneath the arenas. They're, you know, they're, they're laying on concrete floors or laying on bags. They're like butted up in these small holding areas. So it's like, it's really, it's not a great experience outside of going out and competing for the athletes, but having a big football venue where you can walk, where you can breathe, where you have space for the athletes and coaches, it's really going to be, a, I think, I, I believe a better experience for the athletes and the coaches, which is what it's really about, right? And that's one thing Anthony Holman has, has brought up. He's done some interviews with Andy Hamilton at track wrestling on a couple different occasions. And they have been talking about the student athlete because, again, you, you bring this up as a coach. A lot of people don't know that there are student athlete lounges down there, and it and most of the time they're in like a hockey locker room because that's where we've been. We've been, if, you know, you're sitting in the St. Louis Blues locker room or the visiting locker room, or or if we're in an NBA facility like the Q in Cleveland, you know, you were in the Cavaliers locker room or you were in the visiting team locker room. That was about the extent of it. And those places, they're they're not they're built for maybe 25, 30 athletes. Plus, you know, staff, they're not built for 330 athletes. So, yeah, you've got, you know, like any any wrestling tournament and, you know, underneath you're you're away from the fans. And then you're, you're again, looking for any space to, to take a nap or you're going back to the hotel and then there's loading zones. But and that's one thing that Anthony's talking about is the, the student athlete experience. Again, not visible on the, the the rendering, and I think there were a lot of people that were knee jerking, jumping to conclusions. But oh well, where are the people warming up the mats? Well, people are warming up next to the mat, like you said. So we're gonna have space between the mats. We're gonna have photographers down there, but you know the TV cameras weren't there, the media tables weren't there. But they're gonna be away far enough that it's not gonna be obstructions of views. So there are some there are some complaints about that photo. Uh, the photo air quotes you know, the rendering and, you know, some people have gone out as far as putting slices of cheese out there and trying to measure the distances. And there were people saying, oh, city blocks. And I got into some arguments with some fans that, you know, at some point I just had to check out of because it's like, you know what, if you're not going to like it, you're not, you're, you've got a preconceived notion of what it's going to be like 
So you're you're not going to like it. And and it's one of those things that social media, you're not you're not going to change anybody's mind on social media. So I stopped trying. So we're, we're going to see that. Another thing is underneath is is the access again, that student athlete area. They're going to have more space to move around. Uh, you know, you're not going to cram them all into an end zone. Whereas, you know, those that's those athlete seats that have been cut out. Those are seats that they didn't sell too until the finals when the athletes are away. So Matt is a, a, a sending a guy out to that tunnel. You know, you're, you're like you said, you're laying on a floor. So, yes, Anthony Holman has been very open and adamant about the fact the student athlete experience is going to be improved. And again, that's something the rendering didn't show. And, you know, if people would take the time, uh, especially those of us in the media that would take the time to actually ask those questions to the right people, because we have the access to ask those questions. Let's answer those questions and, instead of just shooting from the hip on social without any actual research. No, I'm with you. I think it's going to be a great experience. Uh, again, I think. Most people are resistant to change. I mean, that's that's in general, that's that's human nature, right? But if you look, this is a different circumstance, but there was a lot of resistance when they took it, you know, to a bigger metropolitan area, say Philadelphia in 2011. Oh, New York City. To, 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 Everybody New was York so City, complaining about how right? much it was going to cost. And you couldn't, you couldn't, you know, we're, we're a, I've learned this since I moved to the Midwest. We're a driving culture. If we can't drive our, you know, eight hours, no problem, we'll drive. You get your camper, you're used to parking and be done with it. Well, you can't do that in New York City. I mean, you can. It'll cost you an arm and a leg. But, you know, it's like we, putting people out of their comfort zone is something we did in Philly. We did it more so in New York. And and now New York's going to bid on it again. People loved – well, there's, there's a, a big, big collection of people. To be in the world's most famous arena is only positive for the sport of wrestling. And now – we're, you know, how much media coverage are we going to get out of this? I don't know, but it's going to be record setting. And, you know, you're going to have a, a, a pretty good group coming from that state down south in the state of Iowa coming up north, making that drive. And they can, you know, park and, uh, you know, party it up and probably celebrate a championship. But it's just I don't see I see the drawback from again, from the from the viewing perspective. But I don't see the drawback from the sport perspective. But here's one thing, Matt, like in New York. Well, what did we learn from New York? Well. People actually had a good time there. They didn't expect it, but they if you go in with an open mind, you're going to be surprised. I think pleasantly surprised. Now, Minnesota, if this does not work, well, you know what? We actually have tangible information and a, and a product has to know, okay, you know what? This didn't work. So sorry, Phoenix. Sorry, St. Louis Dome. Sorry, you know, Indianapolis. Places that have giant indoor stadiums that have not hosted this in ever or in some amount of years. Well, it's, you know, Atlanta, it's, it's, th this is, we learned that this doesn't work. Well, what if it does work? We got some warm what weather. We've got does? some warm weather climates that have definitely bid on this thing and they've got large places. So what's the harm? And once every four years we go to a dome. Yeah. I mean, it, for me, it's the more, the merrier. I, I mean, the more people that we can include in this great, I mean, this is, this is the greatest wrestling tournament in, in the world. I, 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 in my opinion, it's one of my for top me, it's five the, for sure. Yeah. For, for me, <laughs> for me, it's, it's my favorite wrestling event in the entire world. And the more opportunities that we can provide for people to experience it for me, the better, uh, because like I said, once you experience it, you're not going back JB. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, give the opportunity to set the hook. I think it's going to be a wonderful experience, but I hope that all the people that are clamoring and resisting this this new environment once they experience it and they're sold on it i hope that they you know will be the first ones to set, step up and say hey i was resistant to this pump the brakes i experienced it this is great let's let's do more of this let's make it bigger bigger than it actually was yeah and, and there's a the thing it's not like and here's where i'm looking at it again i don't have any inside information here i'm just looking at it from my perspective okay so we learned that the entire bowl of a dome doesn't work well, then maybe we go back to the, 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 the horseshoe. So where, okay, well, 40, 45, maybe a little bit too ambitious. Maybe that was a little bit much. Maybe say, you know, St. Louis has got that dome with no football team now. Well, Scott trade has got a pretty, pretty, whatever it is, enterprise center. Now I think it is, you know, they, they're going to host next year. It's like, all right, well, that's, uh, that's, that's big. We can go a little bit bigger if we go with an end zone with a bowl. And, and you can get a lot more stuff into these things. You can have, you know, the warm up areas and stuff. If you have to curtain off, I'm saying let's not poo poo the dome idea. If this doesn't go as planned, we've got, you've got a facility that is gigantic. And then we've got other cities that are interested with these, 
gigantic facilities that can say if we're going if if maybe thirty thousand is is what we learn that that's the, that's the number and that's the dimensions we need. It's it's it, again we we don't know without trying. We can't just you know we, we got to make the spaghetti before we can throw it to the wall and see what sticks. Right. How's that for an Italian cliche? Pretty terrible. That's great. Pretty terrible. Yeah. Now talking about actual wrestling, the conference qualifier breakdown came out. Two hundred and eighty three spots were allocated. This is based on three things. There's the coaches rank, the win percentage, and the RPI rating, which is a measure of strength of schedule where you take your your win percentage, your opponent's win percentage, and your opponent's opponent's win percentage, and it comes up with a number. That tells you basically how tough you are. So if you're wrestling 20 matches against a bunch of guys that are 1-22, and your RPI is going to be pretty low. So again, people kind of get an outrage every year when there's like, well, how this guy's not ranked number if like Jason Nolf is not ranked number one in the RPI. People lost their minds. It's like, again, part of the fact, do we watch basketball? Do any of us watch March, March Madness? Does anybody, the word RPI has been around in sports as long as I can remember since Murray state took Michigan state in overtime in a one sixteen game back in like 89 or 90 RPI. It's a thing. Why do we have to act like we don't know what it means? Cause it surfaces every year. It is not a ranking. It is a rating. It is a strength of schedule. Some people question its relevance in wrestling, but you get two of those three, your silver standard. That's what qualifies you a bid. And right now, ACC with 35, Big 10 with 50, uh, 79, Big 12 with 54, the EIWA with 44, the MAC with 41, the PAC 12 with 16, and the SOCON with 14. A couple things to remember, the MAC and EWL essentially merged, the contracting the EWL into the MAC. So their numbers went up a little bit. We're seeing some uh, pretty good numbers across the board. Of course, the Pac-12, you know, is what it is right now with 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 just 16. The Southern Conference is is they're getting a couple more spots. I mean, it's like right now it's 14, so it's not always a winner take all situation. But you know what's going on down with App State and and Campbell, and of course the the history that Chattanooga's got. So uh, there's there's room for growth there, but nothing really surprising in terms of the numbers that came up, Matt, and, you know, the Big Ten's going to get their numbers. They're going to get their 10. They're going to have those weird extra, you know, 10th place brackets, which are just so, it's so weird to know that, okay, you lost twice. Now you got to keep wrestling. <sighs> yeah, it's kind of, kind of bizarre there. A lot to to wrap your mind around, but, and th there will be a number of at-large bids that are, you know, outside of these two, 283 automatics. There, there will be, what are we, what are we talking? 50 at-large? JB? Well, let's see. At this point, it looks like 47, if my math is right. Or 330. Yeah, right around I don't there. Know, I, I, took yeah, I, I was in college for seven years. And I took stats three times. <sighs> you tell yeah, me. But, but pretty standard. I mean, you know, with the addition of, of with with the merging of the MAC and the, and the EWL, you see that number adjusted. But really, it just rolled in the numbers that, you know, the EI or the EWL was, was getting and rolled them into the Mac numbers. So that, that wasn't that surprising. I think we're seeing obviously a little bump probably in the ACC a little well, bit. Let me pull up but, yield preview guide and just look real quick. Yeah. Me, well, let's see, talk about those numbers. Let me find those conference allocations real quick. Cause I have it up from last year. But we're looking like, you know, big 10 being at 79, I would, I would imagine once the at larges, they'll be in low, low nineties, I would think is, is where the numbers are going to be. You you would think every every conference I would imagine would get anywhere from you know five five plus at large bids I would think um, with probably the a larger portion of that going to the Big Ten um, just based on numbers and you know RPIs <clears throat> but yeah I'm just I'm just trying to go through the numbers just a bit uh, a bit more but it it seems on par JB with with what the numbers have traditionally looked like. The, the last several years. Yeah. And no, that's like I'll, I said, I'll, I'll let you to, I'll let you speak to that more, more specifically once you draw it up, but yeah. Okay. So we got the at large selections by conference, quick qualifiers by total. So last year. Okay. So we're looking at the Mac, like for the Mac, for example, they got 34 last year. Well, the EWL got 22. Hmm. So that was 56. So it wasn't a straight merge. So, you know, hmm. those two together got 56. Well, they're got 41 this year. Well, some of those, those guys from the EWL last year, for example, weren't good enough to qualify the spot, but the conference actually got a bid and, and that's right. going to happen in every conference. But um, in, in terms of the ACC, now this is the qualifiers. If I can get this clicker off of my screen, you know, oh, technology. So looking at what we got last year, this is after the at-large, after the at-large bids last year, 
The ACC got 41. The Big 12 got 52. The Big 10 got 87. The EIWA got 55. The Pac-12 got 25. And the SOCON got 14. Actually, that was the 27. That was the 18 numbers. That was two years ago. ACC last year, 41. Big 12, 61. Big 10, 90. I was looking at my columns wrong. So we're looking at the last two years of data. Uh, 54 in the EIWA, just 17 in the max. So it was actually 47. So I'm looking at the two years ago total was 56. Last year's total would have been a combined 47. Pac-12, 20. SoCon, 17. So that's after the allocation. So my apologies for getting the year wrong. I was reading the wrong column. But that's where we were at. So um, the Big 10... Actually, the ACC was the question. 41 the last two years. They've qualified. They've they've gotten 35. So the question is, do they get six more at large to at least reach last year's total? And then that's a distinct possibility depending on who flops at the conference tournament. That's basically what we're looking like. The at large has come from who flops, essentially. Right. So, yeah, I mean, by and large, though, plus or minus the, the same. Net gain, net loss, plus or minus, which is yeah, standard. Yeah, and every year. And you know, if if you're out there in Twitter world, you know, Seton Hall Pirate Britt Malinsky actually does put out a he put it up on the Matt.com forum and, and his blog at wrestlingbypirate.wordpress.com. I'll give him a little plug there because each year he does this this list of who earned the bids. So you can go dive into it there and see like, oh, okay, that's that's basic because he knows how the system works and there's there's some things out there and looking on, on how the bids got earned. But again, from from a strict qualifier perspective, Matt, I don't really think that this chart of the qualifier data really becomes super, super, super relevant until people start losing until people miss weight and then bids get reallocated and like, Oh no, is somebody not going to get a bid? And they're looking at, you know, there are certain athletes that don't have enough matches to qualify. Like, like Shakur Rashid, we've talked about him ad nauseum at this point, but like he's in that, he's got to get a spot through the, the big 10 qualifying. He's, he's got six spots at 197. He's got to get one of those top six or he ain't going to go. So that's where people yeah. really start paying attention to this stuff. Yeah, and this this harkens back to our conversation from from last week, and you know what went on with Iowa State. And I don't want to I don't want to go back in into that, but then you look at specific cases like Rashid that has no margin of error. Mm-hmm. You have to win. You you essentially, or as other people would like to say, he has to take a spot from somebody else. And when he takes that spot from someone else, should that happen? What happens to that, that other guy? Where does he fall, you know, on, on the consolation side of the bracket? And is he going to be within range? And does he have all the the body of work that gets an at-large bid? So there's there's going to be a ton of, you know, who got left out. Next week, we're going to be having the conversation, who's staying at home, you know, or who punched the ticket that we, we were surprised about. So those are going to be the, the interesting storylines and narratives that come Post post conference championships here next Monday. And one thing that's also interesting is is I'd mentioned the EWL in not earning spots that they get the conference spot this year. According to the Pirate, only one weight class got the free space, as he called it. The only one weight in one conference is basically the auto qualifier. Uh, is it so uh, the Southern Conference at one ninety seven had nobody hit hit go, uh, gold or silver. So that one's just the the champion is that one is going so. You're not going to probably see an at-large at that weight class. But for the most part, everybody else, the conference is at least their, the one bid that they get actually earn the spot. So uh, I'm, I'm curious on what that's going to mean for, for the at-larges. And, and Matt, one thing that's also moving into our, our discussions, we talked about the, the smaller conferences, the, excuse me, the, the, uh, the non-D1 divisions having their, their championships, their regionals last week and such. There's been discussion about should those go to more of a D1 style model and, and looking at, um, people to get left home. And one thing that people need to understand, and as we move to, uh, to, you know, the, the D one discussion is going to dominate us, you know, following this weekend, but you know, the look at Loris, for example, this is in our notes. They, they won the, the lower Midwest regional and they're a real threat to end the, the, the Berg dominance, which has won every division three championship since 1995. I mean, Ithaca was the last team to win division three that wasn't named Berg, and sorry, Heidelberg, you're not in that discussion yet. And when you're and when you're <laughs> saying Berg, you mean Wartburg, Wartburg Augsburg. and Augsburg, yeah, all the Bergs who have won, who have won. Oh. This is phenomenal. A quarter century, mm-hmm. twenty five straight years, this stranglehold has been held in D three by these two schools. Which I can't think of another sport that's been dominated by two teams for so long. And you know, 
to have this one, the possibility of this happening for the first time in 25 years. Mm -hmm. Number two, Laura sits atop the national rankings. They are the number one team in the country right now after beating Wartburg late in the season. Um, yeah. And in their third and something meet. conference wins. It used to be the Iowa conference. Now it's called the American rivers conference, but like, and, and, and Loris being coached by Jim Miller, the legendary Wartburg coach's son, you know, Jim's no longer the coach at Wartburg. He, he retired, but like there's, you know, uh, you know, Jim Miller, Jeff Swenson, Mark Matzik, Jim Molsoff. Those are the names, uh, uh, you know, Eric Keller. Those are the names of the coaches that have won. That was it in the last 25. Those are the coaches. And now there's another Miller and it's not at a Berg that uh, that's making a threat here. So, uh, you know, Augsburg qualified eight, uh, Loris qualified eight, Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey qualified seven. But where I was going with that is that lower Midwest region, which is essentially the old Iowa conference, plus some, you know, there's like Ozarks comes up from, from Arkansas. Go figure how Iowa and Arkansas are connected in that regard. But there was some discussion about the regionalization of of conferences. Now it used to be very much D1, where it was a sliding scale, historical data, and you were, you know, you had politics determining, you know, bids and such. Like the New England conference, for example, had 17, 18 teams at one point. They did a true double elimination. So you would get to the finals, you'd win. You'd have to wrestle a true double elimination tournament kind of like the Little League World Series, for example, to win, you get your spot. And they were like, okay, there are this many schools and they only have this many bids. And again, the rotating five-year, you know, historical placement round of 12 formula. And that was abandoned. They went to regionals and now it's six regions, top three in each region go. And yeah, there's some good kids left home. Now, one thing this is also spurned, it's like, well, we need, we need more qualifiers in division three. They're at 180 right now. So you're getting top three, times six regions, so you're getting 18 to weight evenly. We need to go look at Division One, which says they want more qualifiers. Well, at 330, we've been at 330 since probably the mid-80s. It's, it's anywhere in that range, at 328 to 330, depending on injuries. And we've lost half our schools. So what people need to understand is D1's been spoiled with a giant qualifying standard, and that kind of affects how we we relate things to D2 and D3, whereas there are like 400 and something Division Three schools. 100 of them have wrestling and 18 per weight, you're going to find that that's actually in line with a lot of the qualifying ratios from other sports. So before we clamor about qualifying systems, let's realize that D1, we've got it pretty good compared to some of the other sports. And you know what? Wrestling, you're still better off than a lot of other sports in terms of getting it through. So they're not going to get a whole lot more qualifiers in, in D2 and D3 until you add significantly more schools. So that just ties into the qualifying data before we actually break down you know, some things about those championships that we've got coming up. But Matt, you know, you've, you've got a lot of D2 and D3 schools there in Ohio. You know, your brother's coached it at that level. So, you know, these, these are things that these, that kind of get looked over amongst the national wrestling fans, because again, D2, D3, the NAI don't get the, the discussion points, but their qualifying standards have also been an extremely divisive topic over the years. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you look at, you know, Let's let's look at D1 first and foremost. We actually overqualify for that tournament. And that's probably one of the biggest things when when we've talked about a true dual meet champion. I mean, there's always been that discussion. Why don't we do something similar to track and field and cross country where you have an indoor season and that an outdoor season? They count as crown. two separate sports. Though. Right. <laughs> they count as two separate sports. And so when you when you look at the sport, when you look at wrestling the number of schools that actually offer it, we actually overqualify for the individual tournament. So therefore it wouldn't even be feasible from an NCAA championship perspective to, to have a split, have two different winners. We don't, we don't support or justify the numbers from a participation standard or from an institutional stand standard to actually have two separate national championships. What, one, if they would do that, they would say, hey, if we were going to consider that, we would probably scale down your individual tournament to 16 participants, which people would be, no one wants to see a 16-man bracket at the at the D1 individual tournament, right? But that's what we would probably be looking at if that was really feasible. I don't even think now, we'd, 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 that would even enter the discussion, Matt, because no, no. other sport has two championships. Right. Now, so yes, it's just track, indoor track and outdoor track. Guess what? There are two different sports. Their athletes are also counted twice. You've got a distance runner on both teams. That's one athlete. Right. They've counted twice. So again, and if you want to add another wrestling, you, you bring up the proportionality and the 
the the the gender equity issue again and we've we've actually gotten to the point where we're not fighting that nearly as much because we're also adding women's wrestling programs but you're gonna open if you even want to pursue that oh it, 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 that to me that could be disastrous yeah so then when you when you trickle that conversation down into d2 and d3 i think where most people you know their logic when it comes to wrestling is correct they're like wait a second D3 has over 100 institutions that sponsor the sport of wrestling. D1, roughly 80. How come they're qualifying 330 and we're only qualifying roughly half of them? Yeah, 180. 180, right? Well, you, you, those aren't comparable numbers. You can't say, well, we have D3 has more, D1 has less. Why do they qualify more? Well, D1 is actually overqualified to begin with, and D2 and D3 are actually on par with what the qualifying standards for, you know, they look at a ratio between participation and national qualifiers. That's right in that range. And D2 and D3, three, they actually hit the mark right on. And to your point, they would probably have to add, even though D3 and D2 have expanded the number of institutions that offer the sport, they would have, it would, can, they would have to continue to do that for probably at this same rate, another five to 10 years before they looked at the qualify, qualifying standards and looked to probably raise the level of participants at the national championships. And let's look at this by comparison. So in 1982 was the first year the NCAA started doing participation data. And at mm-hmm. that time, we had 146 schools with Division One wrestling programs. We had 276 division one member schools now let's look at what we had as of last year let's see as of 2018 there were 351 member schools so there was a a a 80 more schools well we had 76 wrestling programs and 146 where we have 80 more schools and half as many in 1982 75 percent of division one schools qualified wrestlers to the championship 2018 94 percent of the teams had at least one qualifier so you know, looking at it, it's like people are talking about getting rid of like, I know Willie, for example, Willie Saylor has pointed out like, what do we need that 33rd qualifier for? And you know what? I'm starting to subscribe to that theory. So I remember sitting in those conventions and people wanting, we need more qualifiers. We need 360. Well, that 360, we also needed back with the old qualifier system when nine and 21, Caleb Flores from Northern Iowa got a wild card out of the out of Western region. Now we've got a system that actually makes more sense. And it might be time to say, you know what? We don't need a we don't need that thirty third guy. I mean, granted, you know, even look at Devin Kane. He was the thirty two seed that made the blood round, not the thirty three. I mean, ten guy, ten extra guys that okay, you're splitting hairs. How many? We I'd like to see some data on how many of those since we've gone to the system. I haven't had a chance to do it yet. Of those 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 pigtail matches at that weight, you know, how many of those actually? How many of those matches they win? Is it? Or should we just have a uniform three uh, three twenty and thirty two man brackets for all? I mean, that's I think that's a legitimate conversation, but that's going to kind of go opposite of the conventional thinking that we need more, we need more, we need more. Well, we've got a system now that's making sure most of the best guys are going, and you know, it's it's very few numbers of at large bids that have ever been all Americans to begin with. I don't believe we even have one that's been a national champion. So, that being said, Division three that was where I was going to go with this participation in Division three wrestling. Oddly enough, in 1981-82, Division One had 146 schools. Division Three had 149. Now, as of uh, let's see, as of 2018-2019, D three is at 108, where Division One was at just at 75. So we're seeing, you know, it it got as low as 87, and now Division Two went from 68 all the way as down as low as to 38. They had 38 teams at one point. Now they're back up to 62 as of uh, last season stats. So. Looking at those numbers and the percentage of schools with wrestling, I've got that here. So the percentage of schools with wrestling at the Division three level right now is 22%. At one point, it was 52%. At Division one, in the wrestling percentage, at one point, it was 52%. It's now 21%. So percentage-wise, schools are kind of in line with, with participation and what they are. So, you know, there's a lot of numbers to consume there. But right now, I think, I think D, D3 could use more qualifiers just because. But at the same point, I also see a reduction of the 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 thirty third guy per weight also being uh, logically functional from a wrestling standpoint at D one. It's definitely logical, but you know, logic 
falling on the plates of a bunch of wrestling coaches. <laughs> we can be our own worst <laughs> enemy sometimes. Like I said, there's yeah. also lies, damn lies, and statistics. So, you know, take those numbers for what they're worth. And that's something I've been tracking. And all that information, as far as the numbers I'm pulling from, are available through the NCAA publications, just kind of Google participation data. And they put out the report every year. So it's not like it's something private. So that's just something to look at because, you know, it's one of those things where when you get into arguments about uh, gender equity and Title IX and wrestling popularity, lacrosse, for example, is is a sport that's always been thrown up as well. Well, they're, they're growing there. Well, not really. I mean, lacrosse has seen 40 more programs in, in 30 years, so it's not like it's, you know, crazy. The biggest gain there has been a Division three, but the scholarship divisions aren't adding it, like, en masse. So, you know, that's that's another reason I keep those numbers, in case you're wondering. Yeah. yeah. I do like lacrosse, though. No, I think it's great. I think it's great. I think it's, I think it will, will ex, it, will it continue to expand at the rate? I think it's still, I, I think that's a 20 year process mm-hmm. to where we, we, we see lacrosse as really legitimate viable numbers, you know, in, in relation to a, a lot of the other, um, intercollegiate sports. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and I mean, it's still, I mean, what in lacrosse we saw our first, First NCAA champ west of the Mississippi, what, two years ago with uh, Denver? Was it Denver? I believe that to be right, the Pioneers. Now, one yeah. thing that's also interesting yeah. about lacrosse is, and this is one of those things where I was looking at the stats from when when Oregon dropped wrestling and they were they had a lacrosse team, I think a yeah, women's lacrosse team, and like they had like one player, two players from the state of Oregon. Half the roster was from Pennsylvania and Maryland. So <laughs> right. those are arguments that thankfully we're, we're not having as much anymore. But back to circling about D3 in terms of the qualifiers. Now, Augsburg with eight, Loris with eight. Stevens Institute was seven and Stevens has had a couple of hammers and, and Troy Stanich, for example, has been a guy that is a two-time All-American. He's been the one seed the last two years. He's still looking for a national title. He didn't place last year. The guy who knocked him out of the tournament last year, Brady Kiner from Warburg, he didn't qualify this year. Carlos Champagne from Wabash, All-American, didn't qualify. Eron Haynes from Nebraska Wesleyan did not qualify. Brock Rathman, a national champion two years ago, he did not qualify. There are a ton of guys for Division Two and Division Three this weekend that just had rough weekends. There was a guy ranked number two. I think um, Anthony Mancini from Nebraska Kearney ranked number two in Division Two. Didn't get out of the region out there. So it is. It is the. I tweeted about this on on Sunday that the 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 high drama with these qualifiers because you've got to win. If you lose in the semis, man, you've got that that Conti semi. You can't do the semi slide and get through. You've got to win, and then you got to win that third place match. And John Boyle from Western New England was a national champion last year. He won his third place match in the new, in the Northeast region, which is New England, two to one. Like you got a guy, just a national champion that is scratching to get back to the tournament. So that's the type of thing we see, and in, in an often overlooked divisions is stories like that. And and I think the team race this year is going to be good, but it's going to be jumbled. We've seen Johnson and Wales really make a push, and Lonnie Morrison, what he's done building that program from scratch. But we, we've got. Coast Guard Academy. Kevin Bratlin was at North Central and then took over Coast Guard Academy. They've got five that are going. Baldwin Wallace, uh, six that are going. Jamie Gibbs at Baldwin Wallace. That program at one point was like their postseason was shut down. Not the not the program, but the whole school. I think a president or somebody came and said, "Nope, our grades are out of sorts. Everybody, no postseason." And then what Jamie's been able to do, you know, take you know coming from UNC Pembroke to to take that job and be like, "Whoa," you know, and had that hit with him. And then you know Marty Nichols at Ithaca has has been been there for years there got six qualifiers it's just D- division three and we talked about my, my favorite tournaments division three matt is one of my five favorite tournaments in the world far none it's just crazy it's fun i could i could rail off about the craziness i've seen in division three for years i've been going since 2009 i've been fortunate enough to announce it for the last five years and it's just like if 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 you ever have a chance to go to a division three tournament and you're a sports fan you're wrestling fans you know you know, goes without saying but you got one seeds that lose every single year. I think last year we had three ones, two one seeds lose back to back on the same mat, or it might have been in Cleveland the year before. It was like, it just it, you can't write stuff that happens at the Division Three tournament because it is nobody cares. You know, you're the D one stud transfer. You're sitting there. You end up in D three. Guess what? You're going to get beat by a guy that probably didn't even <laughs> place at state at some point. Like it is, it is just wild. The the fun no, the, energy I mean, that comes out of D three. Yeah, I mean, there's there's craziness there and the craziness starts with the volatility in the qualifying events and mm-hmm. the regional events i mean it and it just extends all the way through the ncaa terms you, you you talk about kids getting on heaters you talk about national champs not even qualifying for the for the tournament there's so much chaos 
and so much pressure because, you know, think about it. You know, I was, I was talking to one of my buddies, Nate Shear at Washington Lee this weekend, and I, I will give him a plug. They finished in second behind Stevens in the, in the Southwest, uh, Southeast region this weekend, Southwest region. Southeast. Um, There's no wrestling South, in the Southwest uh, right, right now right, for, my bad. for the D3s. But yeah, number number one, what he did, and I, I'll plug him. He was second for the first time, the highest highest finish in program history, you know, taking three guys to the NCAA tournament. But he talked about the craziness of of the weekend. I believe he had thirty one total, thirty three total wins, or thirty one total wins as a team. Twenty two came by bonus points, and he's like, "We're not even a bonus point team." But we just started bonusing people, pinning people, teching people, you know, left and right. And it, it carried them. And they and they won or they didn't win. They got second by one point over Messiah. And we were talking about, you know, that that night after the first day of competition and his and his 157 made it through and uh, all the craziness that was was happening Um but yeah, I mean, it was just so thrilling to see all these storylines that don't get a, a big amount of play. What you have to do is experience this, right? Go to these terms if you ever can. And and the tough part about D3s and D2, it falls typically on the weekend of a lot of high school state tournaments, mm-hmm. so you don't really get to go. Um, I know a couple of years ago when, when I took in some of the D3 tournament, it was during the Ohio State tournament, so I was trying to go back and forth in between the two two events. But yeah, I get it. You know, that's where, where I actually started my coaching career was in D3. So I know the uniqueness. Not only did I coach at the D3 tournament, I was at an institution that hosted the D3 national tournament. So experiencing that where, you know, we're, we, we, we typically don't see that much where institutions still host D3 tournaments. We don't see it as much now. I don't think they do that as yeah, much. Yeah, they've now, they've moved. But... Uh, they've they've kind of moved. Also, they've moved Division two and Division three out of. Uh, and the NAI has done this as well. They're not going to be hosted at schools now. I'm I'm curious, what year was that, Matt? Because I'm I'm trying to put the timeline together without looking, see if I can guess it. What was was it when you started coaching? Where were you at? Ohio Northern. Okay, so it would have been what ninety seven. It what that was ninety seven ninety eight rush. They did they did host ninety seven ninety eight. I wasn't in there until ninety eight ninety nine early two thousands. Yeah. I think we I think we hosted again in two thousand was the year we hosted. Because one of the one of my issues with the movie The Hammer, which is about Matt Hamill, is in the movie. Spoiler alert: if you haven't seen it. He allegedly wins like at his home gym. No, RIT was not hosting <laughs> that year. That no. was an Ohio Northern. No, same colors. Yes, the colors yes, were right. Yes, orange yeah. and black. Orange and black. Polar bears and tigers are vastly different organisms, though. So yes, but yeah. So that was the one thing about that Ohio Northern that, and then that year was like it always kind of just that sours me about that movie is the the historical inaccuracy about it. But speaking of WL, now, it wasn't o- it wasn't Ohio. Matt Hamill is from Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio, but. Yeah, in college, the different different state, different institutions. Yeah, he also mopped up people in the finals those years too. <laughs> it's not like it was a dramatic comeback and whatever. But um, but speaking of Washington and Lee, I grew up in Virginia, and at the time, Washington and Lee, when I got interested, was the only Division three school in the state. Longwood had a Division two program. Norfolk State still had a Division two program. Both of those schools dropped uh, relatively soon after I got into it in in probably ninety nine two thousand. And for years, Washington and Lee was it. Now we've got Averett, we've got Ferrum, we've got Emory Henry starting a program, Shenandoah starting, Roanoke starting a program. We've got a lot more uh, Division three programs adding. But for years, it was just Washington and Lee. And they, you know, Gary Frankie, the, the longtime coach there, he coached like three. He was he was a tennis coach, he was a golf coach, and he was a wrestling coach. Interesting fact about Washington and Lee or WNL, as as the alumni like to say, it's in Lexington, Virginia, and there are three college wrestling teams within like two miles of one another. Two are in Lexington and one's in Buena Vista. Southern Virginia University, which is a relatively new Division three school, they actually got a qualifier through. They were a club team, and then they went varsity, changed their colors and everything. So uh, they're in Buena Vista, and just basically across the street from Lexington, which has VMI and Washington and Lee. So three college wrestling teams, varsity teams in the same, like, basically neighborhood. I'd love to get a map out and see who's got anything closer. But with Washington and Lee, I didn't know much about the program. It was a, it's a very elite academic school. It and when, really and when tough we're to get talking in there. about elite, you know, we, we talk about this all the time, but this is, this is an institution where 
their admission standards are higher than the majority of the Ivy yeah, League schools. Yeah, it's really tough. So, <laughs> you know, a lot of the uh, a lot of the the guys that you know that Nate's getting, you know, they're getting into all the Ivy League schools, and a lot of the guys that are getting into Ivy League schools, he's like, I can't. He's like, Princeton's getting guys, I can't even get into school. You know, so the academic rig- rigors, the admission standards, and and to see what he's doing, not only. Did he get second at his regional tournament? He won the Centennial Conference for the, for the first time in conference history. He was sixteen and five in in his dual in his dual meet season overall. So, what he's doing at the level of institution he's doing it at is absolutely phenomenal. Also, throw some that. Did you know that I believe it was night? It was in the thirties that Washington Lee actually hosted what the NCAA championship. Of course, it wasn't. There was no divisions then, but yes, Lexington, Virginia, once hosted the the NCAA championships. And no the kidding. school has four All Americans. Three of them are the university era. Prior to World War II, they only have one Division Three All American, which Division Three started in nineteen seventy three, and that was Rich Redfoot at one hundred and ninety pounds in 1989 and no i'm not pulling that out the, off the top of my head as far as the year i did know it was rich redfoot because i was keeping an eye on the wnl kids as they went through the constellations last year but that was in 1989 i was turning 10 i'm now <laughs> 40 so the generals have a shot at putting some kids on that podium for the first time in 30 years and again to to to, to spin this to me just a little bit because I'm I'm going to be announcing that tournament. Those are the moments that, as a PA announcer, I freaking live for. The first ever, the first in decades. Those are the type of things that I am. I'm I've got them written down, and I'm ready, and I'm ready to pop when that kid jumps in that that coach's arms. No matter what the school, that's the type of stuff that makes me love what I do in a venue, and that's what I'm looking forward to. This week in Wichita, next week in Cedar Rapids, and then the week following here in Minneapolis. So oh, now, and it, now and you it, it, me up be, at the end of the yeah. show. <laughs> I know. But, I, you know, for me, because there's more history with Nate. Now, not only is Nate, you know, one of my best friends at, the, at this point, he was actually my first NCAA qualifier when I was in, in coaching. He was my, the, one of my first college athletes. He was my first national qualifier. Now to see him go – and do what he's been doing. He's he was the assistant coach at Ohio Northern. He was the national coach of the year at Heidelberg before coming to Washington the Lee. So I can't wait in two weeks in Cedar Rapids to hear you talking about the first general on the podium since 1989. Yeah, at and the thing D3 is, tournament. I don't. And and here's the thing. I say this a lot. I don't care who wins, but I love drama. I love precedent. I love history being made. I love history history being rewritten. Those are the things that like, so like I said, I don't care who wins, but when I see, I see somebody come through the draw, like Averett's got a guy at the tournament this year. I'm waiting for, if you know, Sam Braswell, I think they got two of them actually. Alvernia has got wrestlers at the tournament in their first year. Those are things that I'm looking forward to. It's like, okay, I do this at the NAIs every year because there's more programs there that, that qualify people for the nationals. It's like, okay, so-and-so's first all American. Like, you know, a couple of years ago, it was uh, Warner Pacific. Uh, which yep. you know they had they had a guy, and then they they actually had a team back in the seventies, or I I was at Warner Pacific, yeah, it might have been Warner Pacific that I was thinking about, and to dig it up in the, like or Eastern Oregon had a had their first All American since they dropped the program thirty years later they bring it back. Those are the type of moments I live for, and that's what it's it's really cool to see guys like Nate really come through and and start building a program. You know, it's actually you're not rebuilding a program; it, they really weren't really that great ever. And then you're sitting there like, man, you see the build process. And then you see, you get kind of, you get the, the things in your head going, man, I really wish more people would take an opportunity to try to do this at the division three level that, you know, sometimes people look at it, just, they just pass it off. Oh, it's non-scholarship. Well, I think Nate Shearer, for example, is a guy that's learning more about coaching, building a program at an, at an academically rigorous school with zero wrestling tradition than he would maybe on, on the bench at a division one school. I think that just, without a doubt, it's just, a doubt. And, and the thing is, those stories to me are just as important as Ben Kerr becoming the first All American from Utah Valley. You know, those, those, it's just, that's what makes wrestling great. That's what gets me excited about wrestling is seeing that. And then to know that, you know, WNL is, was, I didn't know anything about him. And I grew up in Virginia. And now, <laughs> you know, I've got a couple, my, my wife's yanked one of my Washington Lee shirts. I've got now one. So, you know, I had two. Now I have one. She's got one she wears pretty much every day. 
So it's just, you know, that's a program that's, been, that's, that's around my house quite frequently. So again, like I said, I don't care who wins. I just love to see high drama and, and history rewritten and things of that nature. So that's really kind of, I, like I said, I'm, I'm getting, getting jumpy about it. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> Could make for a great video for those watching at home. Settle down, man. Yeah. Well, had- tomorrow it's looking like we'll probably get more in depth in, in probably the, the D1 individual qualifying tournaments and probably go in breaking out some storylines there. I mm, also and, want to touch uh, on, uh, on that. Division 2 because we didn't really touch about that because there's going to be a dynamic team race there. Granted, that tournament's in two weeks, so we can also talk about what's going to go on with Steve Costanza at St. Cloud State, Pat Pecora at Pitt Johnstown. Actually, a pro- promotional note that I actually did a, a two-part interview with Pat Pecora at Matt Talk Online on, on my Short Time Wrestling podcast, and he talked a lot about the Hassel Rig era, and he also talked a lot about the Strip Matter era and into guys and, and you know what it was like, the hardest thing as a coach, which was losing an athlete like Nick Roberts. And we really just kind of peel the curtain back on what it was like for Pat Bacora to coach there for 44 years. So it's going to be a real good team race in Division Two, and I'm, I'm glad to be able to talk about that. NAI this weekend, uh, maybe we can touch on that a little bit. Grandview will probably win their ninth straight. I don't see it, you know, the bus has to like blow three tires. And I think they could probably walk to Wichita and with half a team and still win it. But uh, they're going to need <laughs> the rest of the world's going to need a lot of help to knock off Grandview from winning their ninth straight. Yeah, pretty impressive what they're they've been doing. So I'm amped up. We're ending the show anyway. That's what we've got right now. We'll be back with more later in the week talking about those qualifiers, Division Two, the NAIs, and of course everything related to Rudis at Matt the Rudis Wrestling Podcast. Right? <laughs> All right, JB. We'll talk to you tomorrow. That's how we're wrapping it up. <laughs>